Okay, awesome. Welcome everyone to another Research Hub weekly community call. Um, so we've got a few kind of community-driven topics that we can touch on. <clears throat> so we'll just get started. So the first one um, is going to be, what are the most pressing uh, notebook uh, improvements? So we have the lab notebook uh, on the Research Hub platform. It's kind of a version one. Uh, it's got some base functionality. Um, and so just opening the floor to uh, any suggestions that anyone has to improve that or what features are a must. And I, I guess I can start with like a small one, um, which is uh, just kind of a small addition of a subscript superscript uh, into the into the notebook and into regular comments. Because, <clears throat> I mean, I can think of in biology and chemistry particularly where, um, you know, almost every chemical <laughs> you need to have like a superscript for a plus or a negative or something like that. So I think that would be pretty important. And I would imagine if we flush out like some more physics type of hubs, uh, they'll probably require some of those Greek letters as well. Yeah, I second that. It's something that I use a lot, and you know, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely useful, especially especially in comments, like even in in you know, bigger text, but like when you in comments trying to trying to put some formulas, especially formulas in there, um, it's something that is really really handy. Uh, we don't do a lot of like math uh, treatments, but that that could be confusing especially if you're trying to type a formula and you don't have the superscript subscript. Um, yeah, that could be a little bit confusing. Yeah, you can imagine like typing out the word like theta and like gamma like, every time you wanted to use it, you know? So yeah, I think that's that's like a nice addition. Does anyone else have any uh, suggestions for that? Integration of the Terra citation would be nice. I think uh, if I were to write a, uh scholarly article on in ELN, I would definitely need that. You're saying like a, a citation manager, Anton? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think if the goal is to flush out the lab notebook a lot more, then I do think a, a, a citation manager is a must because I personally <clears throat> wouldn't use it to write any like formal documents. Um, if it had no citation manager. I might use it for small note taking, but that's about it. Overall, I think in general, like the, the technical stuff is, is there, you know, apart from the, the citation manager that you just mentioned, uh, you can pretty much write an article on the on, on, on the ELN. Uh, maybe we could, something that we could work on, like even as, you know, as a community is uh, creating some templates. So, you know, depending on the field, it's something that can be pretty useful. Uh, you you know go on a ELN and you already have prepared you know a couple a bunch of like templates that you can share with a community, and that is something that could come pretty handy, especially if we get into you know reviews and so on. And it doesn't require you know engineering from from the devs, so it's even better. Yeah, I think it would be nice to come from um, some of like the scientists in the various fields because they read enough literature to know. Um, what a template for a more like social sciences type of paper would look like versus a template versus uh, for something that's more like hardcore STEM or something. Um, another one that um, I could think of is once you start adding a lot of um, posts on the left side, it starts becoming very difficult to like scroll down infinitely to get to some of your posts. So I think having a very well uh, nested collapsible like foldering system would be really great. Um, so you can have your you know, personal lab notebook and then um, have all the different, uh, say, projects that you're involved in as different folders. And each one of those can be nested uh, with other other folders and documents within them. I think that'd be that'd be a big one as well. And then the, the last one, yeah, thanks, uh, yeah, plus one. Um, so yeah, that would be great. And then the last one, I think this one is kind of big and it, is an extension off of the lab notebook, kind of. Um, but I've been trying to uh, probe a few people to ask, you know, would they consider putting up their preprints on Research Hub? Um, and I think the consensus is, if their intention is to upload it to a really low impact journal anyway, uh, they have absolutely no problem putting it on Research Hub. <clears throat> the only discover, the only issue that has been brought up almost every time is discoverability, which is 
if I upload my preprint to Research Hub, will it be on PubMed or searchable on PubMed? Um, and the answer I give them is no, not, not as of now. And so I think that would be kind of a big breakthrough for people putting their preprints on Research Hub would be if we can forward those preprints to uh, PubMed. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Jeff. I think we can definitely get indexed by those search engines. Um, and I've heard that as like a value prop for other like preprint server types of repositories as well. So that's definitely something we should look into. These are great suggestions, by the way. I think like part of the motivation was um, I was playing around with the notebook uh, last week and adding in figures. We don't have the ability to like caption figures, you know, which is like a pretty like basic you know, requirement if you want to actually publish, you know, some kind of scientific research output. And so the idea was starting to, like, um, prioritize improvements to the notebook itself to, uh, you know, eventually get to the point where you could publish a preprint, you know, pretty easily through the notebook. Um, and just, like, getting a list of maybe that 10, 20, 30, like, small features um, to put them in a list just to start thinking about how we can build them. Uh, an another one that we were thinking about is like the ability to like export um, research of notebook publications to like different type of file formats. Um, not sure if like those kinds of like less flashy things are important for like the actual like practicality of working in a lab. So you're saying like exporting that document as like a Word document or a PDF so you can circulate it to other people? Yeah, just in case they don't want to use the notebook or even, I know there's like, I'm going to get this file format wrong, but like XLM or something like that. Like if you if you download research outputs from like Frontiers in, for instance, they have like a bunch of different file formats. Yeah, I think, I think that one would actually be like semi-big uh, because <clears throat> yeah, I think people are st stuck. Yeah, if I if I use Research Hub to create my my content and I can't share it to anyone in my lab if they're not on Research Hub, you could think about it one way, which is you're going to onboard all your friends to Research Hub and your colleagues. But um, if not, then it's kind of uh, you're almost shooting yourself in the foot where you have all this content, you have to recopy and paste it to a new document and lose formatting and things. So I do think it's it's kind of an important one. Yeah, totally. We could have some kind of like cool PDF export where like the branding is there. That way people are at least aware of Research Hub when they see the PDF happen like two or three times. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point. Almost like a tiny little watermark in the corner or something like that, like in our YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think I think that would be. Uh, yeah, that, sound, that sounds pretty good, actually. These are great suggestions, though. So so like uh, like subscripts superscript, templates, folders on the left-hand side. Um, anything else when it actually comes to, like, like maybe, like, using uh, LaTeX? Anything like that? Sorry, what was it? Using what? Uh, like, being able to write in LaTeX, uh, like, within the notebook in order to help format, like, what the actual, like, publication looks like. Mm. Like, overly kind of. So I, I don't use LaTeX, so I, I, I cannot provide anything uh, useful in this regard. But uh, something else that, that popped to my mind, uh, talking about the different sections, is something similar to um, what Notion has, the toggles. So like collaps uh, collapsible sections. If you have like a long article that you're writing, I don't know how difficult it is from an engineering perspective having like the different sections, you know, like the summary, the introduction, and so on, to be collapsible so that you can have everything in a more kind of like compact way. Oh, that's a great suggestion. I think we could definitely do something like that. Yeah, that'd be a good one as well. Another one that I could think of that's a little bit, um, <clears throat> I guess, not like a kind of traditional thing, but um, I'm thinking about it from like the perspective of uh, making like picture collages on like, I don't know, on Instagram, for example. Um, so figures often have like eight panels or, or more sometimes. Um, and so it's really annoying to have to format that. It actually kind of takes a long time to format things in like a Word document where you're just like formatting and making sure everything's really aligned. Um, I think what could be really nice is if we had like a nice UI of like, 
here's like where my figure goes. I want to add X amount of panels in that. And then it like is it already comes in very well aligned and you can adjust the sizing of whatever panels very easily by dragging. Um, and then you can insert your your figure that way. I think that would help um, kind of streamline and it will have a consistency in terms of like organization of the figures that come out of it. Yeah, that's a great idea. Like a, almost like a carousel of the different like like panels. I like that a lot. Yeah, yep, exactly. And we have um, something from Justin over here. Uh, maybe add features to comment on certain parts of a note for Sorry. Um, so maybe add feet. Uh, so Justin said maybe add features to comment on certain parts of a note for collaboration purposes. So I think this is something like an in inline comments um, or the ability for inline comments uh, in the notebook feature. Would uh, just to, to dive into that a little bit more, uh, Justin, are, are you thinking like free publication comments, kind of like Google Doc collaboration or like post publication? anyone can comment and like leave feedback and then in, in line fashion. Mm. He said uh, in the in the chat. Uh, yeah. Yeah, pre publication. Okay. Yeah, you're right. That's a that's a you know pretty necessary feature anytime you try and write something with like Google Docs or Notion. Yeah. And it's there for like everything, even like Loom has like the in line or in video comments and things like that. So totally. Okay. Does anyone have any other um, final like kind of feature requests for the notebook feature? Maybe something else uh, on on a on the lateral like panel in the workspace. Maybe having the ability to see um, if there's a if there's a, an article that you're working on with other people, be able to see from the outside that there's other people working on that. So like having, I don't know, like a small icon of people that are that are collaboratively working on that um, could help. If you, like I'm just imagining, you know, after like a year or two years that you're using Notebook, you have a lot of like documents and so on. You wanna see all the people that are uh, collaborating. That could be one thing, but it's just a small one. So it would be like uh, like we kind of have the feature now where you can see uh, avatars of who's on the document and so yeah. saying like a historical register, like anybody who's ever like contributed to it. No, oh, no, more like uh, you know you have the all of the, the list of the different you know in in your workspace the list of the different articles, and then like you know I don't know like you you make that uh, each each line a little bit bigger, and at the bottom you can list like I don't know this is just uh, there's like RG if I'm working on that, and there's like RG plus. Uh, uh, JK, if Jeffrey is also working on the same document, so, on. so you can see from the outside without getting into each document who's working on uh, a different document. Oh yeah, that's a good call. We definitely do something like that. These yeah. are all great suggestions, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think the notebook has like a lot of really exciting potential. A lot of people don't quite know that it exists there. Um, so it'll be exciting to see uh, people flock into it and then probably give more suggestions down the road as well. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's something we're going to try and chip away at just consistently, you know, while we build other major features. Um, just trying to use it the other week. It's like, I I would be frustrated, like, if I was a lab um, and demoed it, thinking that, like, it would be able to support, like, our, you know, full functionality within a lab. So I think like getting to that point will be a big deal. That way, when people click into it, they're like, "Oh, this works." You know, it's not like small things that frustrate them and turn them off from it. So I think it's definitely worth trying to build some of these like um, basically like required features to have scientific publication. Yeah, yeah, totally. And if it's not like kind of the primary value prop of Research Hub, I think it makes a lot of sense to chip away at it in parallel with building out other things that that are better suited. Yeah. Um, OK, so then uh, we can move on to the second point. We've got five points uh, in total. So the second one would be um, one that I, I was suggesting, which is um, kind of what everyone's thoughts are on the integration of a self-custody wallet. We touched on this a little bit briefly, a previous community call. But um, I think there are both there are both pros and cons to it. And I think it's like really 
intimately um, uh, involved with whatever we decide to do down the road and if how much that would require a self-custodied wallet. Um, so just interested, just high level, what everyone's thoughts are, like a thumbs up, thumbs down um, integration of a, of a custody self-custody wallet. So I'm in favor, in general, of having a self-custody wallet on on Richard Chubb. Um, but I, I I don't know again how like how big of a priority that could be um, in terms of like all of the things that we want to develop, and if it's something that we want to think you know uh, along the way and how to how to um, get it out as best as we can. Um, if it's not you know like a top priority, but I, in general, like I'm I'm in favor. Okay, I see. So just to help. Just help me wrap my head fully around like the the feature. A self custody wallet would be like an Ethereum sign in, where when you earn tokens, they're automatically deposited to your wallet, or like say like you mint an NFT or something, it automatically goes to your wallet rather than having like research help hold onto it until you like manually withdraw it. Is that how like the the UX would be improved? Yes, we don't want Brian holding on to all our assets. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's a reasonable opinion. Um, I think the one difference is like, um, like gas in theory, like it would have to be like a regular kind of like withdraw to the wallet. I don't know if it makes sense to do it like in real time, because then it would be like multiple transactions a day in theory. Yeah, I Unless think gas is really cheap. I think even with gas being cheap, like you're still paying um, on a transfer, like a buck or something like that. Um, and so if, I think it's not like very economic. Um, if we're on another layer two, it'd make a lot more sense. I think the one thing that it adds to, I mean, you can have it integrated, um, kind of connect to your account. Your account can function as it normally does. But <clears throat> like, for example, if we do start integrating, say, crowdsourced NFTs for a crowdfunded uh, NFTs, or if we wanted to do the sold down token for publications, um, it, I think it'd be a lot easier on the integration for that to say, hey, I just published. And then if you click the mint NFT for me box, um, you know, there's a quick, easy thing that you just sign off on and it goes right into your wallet that's connected to your account. Um, so, so something like that is what I was thinking. Uh, by the way, at some point, we're probably going to want to switch to a, a layer two, right? There's a, just wondering. Any thoughts? It's, it's something we've thought about. Um, it would like it gets a little bit complicated because then, um, like in theory, a new user would have to understand what like Polygon is, um, or or just yeah, there's a little bit of a knowledge barrier uh, for using layer twos, you know, which in theory most academics who haven't even heard of like Bitcoin, you know, it's just a, another barrier. But I think we do think that Ethereum will eventually uh, like become. Uh, scalable or like if it's clear that it won't it will become imperative to switch to another chain but i think like right now we don't we've talked about it a little bit and don't have any like you know tangible plans on the horizon of switching to a layer two i, I definitely see the value of self-custody for like uh like authorship um credit um that's for sure a big deal i, I think like uh what we'll do eventually is like you can still participate in the whole system, you know, even without a wallet. Like if you don't even want to withdraw stuff, you know, to like uh, your own wallet, you can still do everything. But then, like, if you'd prefer kind of these more like customized like solutions, like allow for them. So, like the default would be uh, custodied by like Research Hub, you know, Amazon servers. But then if people wanted to like integrate their own wallet and have things like automatically routed to that, they would be able to. So to allow for that depth of like customization. But yeah, I guess like um we'd have to see that like stopping people from using Research Hub now. It, I think it's something that we definitely should do, but um it feels lower priority than experimenting to find product market fit. Agreed. Yeah, also agreed. Um yeah, I think it just was something that I was thinking, depending on what the rest of the roadmap looked like. Um, so like if we want to say incorporate funding, maybe it's not so 
so big of a deal if a funder a funder probably doesn't care to want to have self custody about and just sign the transaction that they're going to give a million dollars to this you know person who submitted a grant but like if we were going to go down say um kind of and i think any nft route i think integrating a web3 wallet sooner would make the um the integration with the nft a lot more seamless and probably less of a headache for the engineers in the long run yeah for sure it, it makes a ton of sense when it comes to like minting nfts for papers and authorship credit and stuff like that yeah are there any like i guess cons to integrating that maybe something like people can just spin up a bunch of wallets and make fake user accounts and and spam the website is there like would there be an issue with mitigating some of that spam i think it's like gas fees is the biggest con in my mind um but if people were willing to pay for them then you know it's like the own person's preference um and then the other con would just be the time that it would take to build it and maintain which is like a small to medium con, not not really like super big deal. I think that would probably take us like two weeks, like of full attention. Um, but yeah, I think the the bigger issue would be who pays for gas because right now Research Hub, like the you know organization, is paying for it um, with like a Research Coin fee. But get, getting that right, I think, would be a little bit tricky depending on how often people wanted to withdraw. Got it. Yeah, I think the 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 fee would yeah be a, up to the person because they'd be having to pay the fee through their direct transaction with the wallet. So, <clears throat> um, but yeah, depends. I think there would be a, a a bucket of people that would be content with paying larger amounts of fees to maintain custody. Um, but I think the larger scientific community probably generally doesn't care. Yeah, I think that's kind of our perspective now, you know, with open open to having, you know, that perspective change. But yeah, I think self-custody wallets, it's like crypto people love it, but like the, the average person, you know, barely understands why it's necessary and they just want to have their password, you know, recoverable. So I think there's a certain like, you know, segment of our target user that would love it. But not sure how much like the average target user, you know, would find extra value at this moment. Yep. Yep. I think, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I agree. And I think like related to this, uh, this is probably also the reason why we're not having any kind of like uh, wallet integrated kind of like signing option. And we're going through, through Google because that's kind of like easier, easier to do, easier for people to kind of like log in. Because that would be that would be pretty interesting to me to like be able to to log in just through my wallet, but yeah, I guess that's low priority as well. We've had like a, a lot of demand for this feature, and we've like pushed trying to build it a couple times, and it just hasn't stuck. So like, I think probably post product market fit, it'll make more sense, or or it's something that we could probably try and spin up within the open source community um, if somebody was like really excited about it, and then we could probably add it there just as like uh an option at the top like sign in with your e wallet because i know there are some like uh i think some companies that help make it pretty easy I, I saw like a magic link company last week too um that does some pretty cool things so yeah maybe that's a good open source project okay yeah i think that'd be good i think just like a if you went down that route just like a metamask Coinbase wallet and wallet connect probably makes a lot of sense to just have those three options. Um, Cole was asking um, if it'd be more difficult to adjust as time goes on. If, if wallets would be more difficult to adjust? I, I think so. Um, I think it would be, it seemed like the same lift uh, when it comes to actually building the integration, or it would be probably like two weeks of our team's time, um, no matter when we did it. I think if it's sign in with Ethereum, this feels less uh, scary in the fact that we're not really storing any user data. So 
you know, there's not like a larger attack surface um, because of that, as opposed to if we like get our own uh, like email password sign in uh, like protocol. So I don't think it would make a difference whether we did it now or if we were doing it like while we were growing quickly. Okay. I could yeah. be wrong though. We'd have to ask we'd have to ask Kobe. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Okay, yeah, something to consider would be yeah, to open source it. Um so I know Tyler, you said you're traveling, but maybe that's something to keep in mind too as open source devs start rolling in. Um maybe consider like putting up a a bounty for that. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we can uh, we can go on to the next thing, which is um, so Joanna was asking about um, uh, like interoperability between hubs, and then also like how to uh, leverage outside and inside involvement and tasks. Um, so Joanna, do you think you could elaborate maybe a little bit on um, on this? Yeah. So. I think Patrick's point about Open Alex, it's very nice in the sense that how Wikipedia does like directing a link from something scientific to another something scientific that maybe relates to another discipline. And I think it would be nice for the hubs and the persons who contribute to maybe to form teams or to um, start real life projects either in the laboratories or at school or yeah we we discussed about that in some previous calls so that that was what I was thinking about. Okay, so like uh, I guess like in, instead of interoperability, maybe more like multidisciplinary, uh, where <clears throat> you like for example, like what Ricardo did um, with that one paper, where Ricardo and a couple of other people who had similar kind of similar backgrounds but slightly different lenses that they were looking at the same paper through and they got together and were able to uh to kind of give their own perspective on that on that paper yeah i think that makes a lot of sense for the way research hub is right now uh, blockchain i mean interoperability interoperability is more related to the blockchain stuff in the sense that hmm, you can connect information and uh, channels and chains and uh, institutions and so on you know secure sense so let's say like a fax machine <laughs> but this is like very old school and yeah, so I think it would be nice to to create something like a search engine or or something like that that it's connected one to another in the sense that the internet works. Okay. Yeah, I think also like what makes sense. I think with this example is like a maybe like a little marketplace as well where mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah you can kind of call upon people from different hubs um to say hey i'd like your expertise on this thing or i'm doing the experiment in the lab and i need your help but it should be coming from another hub because they're the expert on that segment yeah it would be nice okay it would be pretty cool if a more robust reputation uh mm -hmm. you know system where you could create a bounty that can only be filled by you know someone of a certain reputation in a specific hub so you could yeah basically like request you know top 10 percent of biostatisticians to come over and help you with a specific task or something totally yeah yeah dwork has something kind of similar but it's it's based off of uh you could like 
uh, Discord role gate something or uh, or token gate it. So if they owned a particular NFT, only the person who owns that NFT would be able to uh, to be able to fulfill the task or even apply for that task. So I think something similar to that um, definitely makes a lot of sense. I think it's even more applicable to internally to research hub than it is to something like D work that's a little more broad. Yeah. I think this will be, um, you know, will become much more easier, uh, much easier when when we implement tags, hashtags in general, because that, that way you could have like, you know, you have uh, you're publishing a paper or you're uploading a paper uh, and you're uh, putting a couple tags there to like, I don't know, COVID-19 and you're uh, studying epidemiology and I'm studying, I don't know, I'm fabric and developing a sensor for that. And maybe we can come together and, you know, do something together. So. All of that uh, multidisciplinary activities that we kind of like spearheaded, uh, you know, kind of like individually a couple months uh, ago, would be way uh, way easier uh, to implement when we have hashtags, and that will come. I think will come pretty much naturally. So people will gather together, and then we we'll, we can have a couple of bunches for I don't know like joint reviews where people analyze a paper from different perspectives. So. Uh, there's a ton of things that we can do there either individually just by you know people teaming up uh you know on discord creating like i don't know not like study groups or like working groups on a specific paper or uh more like systematically through the platform but uh you know once we implement hashtags uh because that way it will be just yeah easier in general yeah so this is actually like a perfect transition uh so thank you ricardo um one thing i wanted to bring up uh, at this call is I was looking through Open Alex. If you are familiar with Open Alex, it's like a um, open source like uh, citation database. So it tracks like uh, all research publications like every day as they're published. Like who are the authors? What institutions did they attend? Like who like gave the grant for this research? And one of the things that they do that's really interesting is they apply like concept tags to uh, all of the scientific literature that's ever been published and all of the new literature every day. And so what these are is it's like basically a six layer tree starting from like 19 base fields of like philosophy, economics, physics, you know, uh, biology, all the way down to like the, the example, um, I don't know if this is actually right, but it would be like, Biology would be the base layer, and then there would be genetics would be layer one, and then like epigenetics would be layer two, and then histone deacetylases would be uh, layer three, and it would just keep on going down forever. And so this is um, something that's already been created, essentially on OpenAlex. Um, we could just turn on these tags where uh, like some AI has already like done a first pass of labeling every paper with these concepts. There's like 200,000 of them and like each paper, I think it's like 85% of them have at least one tag and then it increases kind of like their normal distribution after that. But um, yeah, just curious what uh, everybody thinks of that as a potential way to like kind of cut corners to a tagging system um, without necessarily needing any like manual labor and like minimum uh, like engineering time required. massive plus one on that i think that'd be really great depending i guess how it's how it's implemented if we can easily involve that in like searchable and like discoverability stuff on the platform and then also um i mean if if like there's a way to if if we could incorporate a way to also add a tag um that might not be on there or even like remove some tags that I'm sure like the AI doesn't label them 100% correctly. So if there's like some kind of ability for us to manipulate it a bit, I think it'd be huge. Yeah, I think we could do something where maybe editors earn coins for like correcting uh, tags or like making more detailed tags. And then I'm, I'm pretty sure we can even do something uh, with reputation through it where like authors, you know, if their publications have like these concept tags, then they'll like increase their, you know, rep within that concept or something. Um, there's a lot of different cool things we could do, but it basically just saves us the effort of having to assign tags. Like they're, they're all done for us in like a systematic way that OpenAlc agrees with.
Yeah, I think it could be a great, you know, transition until we decide, I don't know, to develop something internal. That could be a really, really good place to start. Yeah, the Maybe. more yeah. Oh, go in for this... it. Okay. Maybe in this way, we can start also the citations management. Because... It's easier. Is that correct, Patrick? I mean, could we connect? Sorry, you mind saying that again? I'm not sure if I fully understood. Hmm. Could be a start to connect multiple databases for a citation management system. Yeah, I think we could definitely incorporate uh, the data that they have. There's like two or three of these different kinds of databases out there. This is just the first one that I'd seen that did like a uh, fairly uh, detailed tagging. Yeah. So how would that practically work? Uh, so we have we still have to upload the papers on Research Hub, right? And then we interact with the interface on OpenAlex because I'm not familiar with the tool. So how would that work? So, well, exactly. What would happen is like when you'd upload the paper, a mm -hmm. couple of concepts would be automatically tagged. So oh. it, it would be like a, another piece of metadata next to like the authors, the journal. It would be like, we could say like, hey, here are the keywords or like key concepts or something. Massive. Okay. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. That's, that's definitely something that we should try out. Yeah. The thing I was thinking is like, we have a weird issue where like, you know, if you're a grad student, you're, you know, realm of expertise where you'd probably feel comfortable like, you know, talking about it online. And so if you show up to Research Hub and you want to learn about like histone deacetylases, that's like what you study, you can't really find them. You know, like genetics doesn't really fit. Like if you go to like cancer, that doesn't really fit. So basically your realm of expertise is undiscoverable. And so we're a little bit too broad. Like we have to facilitate like very broad discovery, but then also discovery within like a subfield where people can like find, you know, relevant conversations to them. Yeah, I think the tags make, I think they make a lot, they keep making more and more sense as I think about them more. I think that's, it's it seems to be underlying what a lot of people keep discussing about. So yeah, I do think it would be a nice, a nice implementation. Do you know, Patrick, if, we would then use any of those tags to maybe restructure like layers of hubs or anything like that, or use it. So like, for example, if there was a cardiology tab, I just using this example, because I saw Nathan come in, but if there was a cardiology tag, um, then we still have a cardiology hub, but if someone uploads something into medicine and uses the cardiology tag on it, then it's like almost kind of weirdly redundant where like, do you need the cardiology hub because you have the cardiology tag now? And so that would kind of force us to um, kind of reconsider certain um, hubs. Yeah, I think the way this makes sense in my mind, if we decide to build this now, it, it would be a little clunky. Like we were just trying to do tags in to see like how they fit, how people use them. Um, and then in theory, like when we do the hackathon around reputation, um, basically say, hey, this is another way that we can potentially like do a uh, help structure or like uh, have uh, a reputation go from like a like top level hub to like sub hubs or whatever. Um, and then make a change, like a more permanent, complete, well thought out change after the hackathon. If that makes sense. I think what we could do is uh, to make it kind of like complementary, like the the the, the tags and the, the hub structure, a good solution, at least starting with uh, the new structure, could be having uh, the hub structure. I don't want to say the more general possible, but having a broader, um, let's say broader, um, kind of like field. So we have, you know, we start with the with the big hubs, and then we get into like a second layer with like smaller hubs. 
but then the real granularity is added uh, through tags. So in that way, the hubs are kind of like broad enough for people to be able to discuss a lot of topics. But at the same time, so someone that just wants to learn about something specific, example COVID-19, could do that through the use of tags, interacting with people from different hubs. So that at least within hubs, we don't have hubs that are like too specific and there's no people, uh, there's like not enough people in there uh, to discuss a specific topic. And it's more like, yeah ops like that are talking to each other totally the other thing we can do is something where like maybe some of these like um uh, more niche tags like they're like unopened hubs where maybe like uh, you can be hit with a, a banner that says hey you know are you a neuroendocrinologist like do you want to be an editor of the neuroendocrinology hub like get 10 people to say or 10 like neuroendocrinologists to claim papers and say they'll participate and then boom, it's unlocked and you're the answer or something like that. That's a great idea. Like having tags that after a certain kind of like threshold of activity can converge into hubs if they're like big enough. Yeah, especially if it goes niche. And I think just the, the tagging system from Open Alex is from like the uh, Microsoft Academic Graph where they had a product and tried to essentially like uh, help them categorize like all research outputs so it's pretty systematic and i think like established and respected as um a way to do like the taxonomy of science yeah yeah that sounds good does anyone have any other uh comments about the open alex integration we already integrate open alex to some extent already so this Sounds like it'd be pretty easy, right? Just like literally like integrate one other thing from them. Can I just yeah, say, pretty much. sorry. Uh, go ahead. Uh, what you just mentioned might actually be a larger solution to the hub restructuring issue. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, yeah, that's all. Because I, I especially haven't. Like niche reputation, I think is very cool. Where like to to allow experts in their subfields to be recognized as such, but still like hold you know above layperson expertise in like related fields. Um, I think could be very cool. This allows for like uh, interdisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, like I guess reputation too, because some of these concepts like they have their tree structure hierarchy. But like a, a paper might be tagged with like a third layer deep level of engineering, but then also like a fifth layer deep level of physics. So that way the author could in theory like gain reputation in you know both physics and engineering, which is probably you know more of an accurate way to track it. Okay, that that also means uh, a tighter control on the hubs that are selected. Because let's say someone publishes something on a hub that is not you know, correct, then I'm gaining some reputation in a hub that is not the hub that I should gain reputation in. So that also means kind of like a tighter control of their selection of the hubs, I guess. I think there's a lot of cool implementations that uh, it would help facilitate. Yeah, Nathan? Yeah, I like it. it. It sounds a bit like if anyone's used Rome research and you've seen how the knowledge graphs build up, where just by tagging different pieces of information, so different papers or whatever, um, you start to build these sort of wider concentric rings that link to each other. So you might have, yeah, medicine linking to all the subspecialties of medicine and then whatever, but then there's nothing stopping medicine linking to bioengineering, which might be in a completely different orbit, but you get that sort of slight link there. And so then, yeah, experts could then also sort of span those different like cross-disciplinary links. I, I really like that idea. And I think also um, this would be at scale, really awesome for even um, kind of external projects or journals where um, they have like an easily filterable reputation system to ask people for uh to review or to be like um kind of reviewers of grants or something like that because the way like for grant reviews you know usually you have three or so reviewers but um generally um a couple of them are in the 
higher level field that you're in. So they're in neuroscience, but maybe they don't understand efferent biology. Uh, and then generally there's one person that has some kind of um, expertise in that little niche. Um, and so I think it'd be very, very useful to uh, for other people to maybe I don't know, pay some kind of fee um, and then they can leverage that system that we have built up with all the reputations to filter through people and you'll be able to call upon the right person for the job. Yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, just making like grant application more effective, like recruiting reviewers. It's a great idea. Yeah, and, and for publications as well. I have a publication that's been in submission for like, um, I don't know, three, four months now. Um, and the first two months were just them trying to find reviewers for us. So if that can even help alleviate it for even our quote unquote traditional legacy competitors, um, that's still like a big win for accelerating science. Totally. Okay. Um, so then uh, since we already knocked this one out, then the other one we'll jump to, which is the last one on the list, <clears throat> which is um, brought up by Ricardo, um, which is how to bring up um, kind of exposure to expiring bounties. So Ricardo, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, so I was browsing through the bounties section on, on the homepage. Now we have that section. So I was kind of like browsing through it. And I was looking for uh, some recent bounties. And I realized that, you know, there was a, a couple of bounties from Sadvik. Uh, one that kind of like, I think it's, it expires in like uh, at midnight. Another one is expiring like a couple of days. And I was like, um, damn, I should have uh, learned, I, I should have known that, you know, a bounty was expiring like today. And so uh, that brought me to think, okay, there's, uh, we should find a way to advertise expiring bounties. I think, you know, on the homepage, at least kind of like, you know, the, at least the, the last day of uh, potentially, you know, submitting an answer, but even like three days before, I think it's a good kind of like deadline for uh, kind of like a good reminder, let's say for, for the bounties. And then uh, after the bounty has expired, um, I think it would be nice to kind of like have some way to kind of like publish the initial question and the selected answer. Uh, I don't know exactly how, to publish that, even if it's like a like a another post or a different avenue, but having a way to sh to show, okay, this is this was the original answer. Sorry, this was uh, the original question, and among all of these answers, this uh, was selected as the you know the, the best one. Kind of like a recap. Yeah, this is a great point. Um, I, I guess so. We've been thinking about this a little bit, but would like to hear like in your ideal world, like what would be a good way to help bring people's attention to like soon to be expiring bounties. So uh, first of all, I think a banner, I think the banner for uh, Cycon worked pretty well, unless ju like judging the clicks that, that it got, like a banner at the top with like a list of expiring, uh, expiring bounties. That could not work extremely well at scale, because uh, that would be you know pretty big if there's uh, was a lot of like bounties expiring, but uh, for now, I think it could be a good solution because we would, I think we would have like one or two bounties expiring per day. So that could be a good way to, to show that in the on page. And I would say, you know, like a, the last day, a reminder, you know, one day before the expiration date would be enough. Totally. So, so what we were thinking about doing, this is like kind of the same, like a little bit more subtle. But um, in theory, like as a bounty was expiring, I think when it's one day away, to send a notification to people who have subscribed to that hub. So it would start out as like an in-app notification. Um, so if like a, a question bounty is expiring in the next 24 hours, like when you log in, you've got a notification saying like, hey, go click on that fixed question and answer it if you want to earn XRSD or something like that. And then um, what we do after that or what we've talked about doing is uh, also emailing. So not just having in-app notifications, but like having some kind of regular digest that goes out to uh, everyone who's followed a specific hub of bounties, saying like, hey, here are the bounties most relevant to you. And then maybe at the bottom, it can be like, by the way, these ones are expiring, you know, this week. So go ahead and answer these because they need answers or something. Um, and then another thing we were thinking is like, so on the homepage right now, the default filter for bounties is like a hot score, kind of, um, where it's a combination of like upvotes, like 
answers, like supported RSC that helps to dictate kind of the like order that you see them. Um, and so one thing we can do here is uh, like if, you know, maybe it's like the last 72 hours and a question hasn't been answered yet, we can like inflate its weight within this algorithm. So that way it's more likely to show up to the top. Um, my, my thoughts here are like, I think, I think we should have a filter. I think the default filter should, for bounties should just be total bounty. Um, so like if you want to get exposure on your bounty, the way you do it is by putting a lot of research coins on it. Um, so like doubles as advertising almost. And then I think we should have a filter for uh, ending soon or something like that or, or like inverse time to like completion or something. So that way you can see like the bounties that are ending soon. Um, but yeah, so, so long diatribe there, but basically like, uh, I think we can help to uh, like uncover them, you know, for discovery better through like filters and then uh, in-app notifications. And then in theory, once we uh, build this part out, like a, a bounty digest, more or less that things people with relevant to. Yeah, big plus one on the kind of like expiring soon. And that could just be a filter of like less than 24 hours. And you have that section uh, filled with like bounties that are uh, expiring soon. And I, I already see that you have, uh, you know, you kind of have like a different color for bounties that expire. I, I don't know how like how long, like it's probably like less than 24 hours. The 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 expiring day becomes red. So that was already thought, I think, in at the beginning uh, the email. Yes, could be a good idea. Again, I don't know how um, how many emails I could get uh, for like if actually if we include that in the digest, uh, yeah, that could be a good idea. Because otherwise, if I get I like an email every day for like expiring bunches, that would be I think pretty uh, like too much. Um, and yeah, a big plus one for notifications as well. I think they they it doesn't hurt to have uh, some in app notifications. And they're probably the one that you know I would prefer even more than emails, because I have everything in there on research help. Oh, uh, another thing that we've thought about, too, is like uh, having the editor's role essentially uh, include like trying to make sure that most of the uh, questions that have bounties have at least one answer to them or are answered by the initial person. Um, and so like in theory, we could uh, ping editors if they have expiring uh like bounties soon to kind of like help them do like the like uh social side of recruiting people who could potentially answer it or whatever um kind of like a traditional editor at a regular journal like recruits peer reviewers um so that that could be like a next step but i think like just helping to make people you know aware of them is is good to get started and that could be a banner or a notification or whatever i think including the editors would distort the market you know, maybe what, like however the person, whatever price the person is putting on the bounty isn't adequate, then having the editors answer it. Um, I think it would be, make more sense to just make the information available and then have the pricing, uh, like have the person be able to adjust the pricing to reflect the actual value of the information that they're seeking. Yeah, totally. I think, I think there is an aspect of like, uh, um, just making people aware of it though, where like in theory, that's a decent email to get if you're a researcher and someone's put a bounty on like a question and it's like, oh, hey, you can earn, you know, X dollars if you answer this within the next three days. Um, yeah, the, just a, an early idea. I don't think we'll go in that direction, but. No, if they're first. just making other people aware, um, you know, but I feel like they're, you know, like if you're on Research Hub, there should be a way of the website just like making you aware of what bounties might be relevant to you, other than having the editors reach out to people specifically. That that will be just as effective, it seems like. But if we're having them do the answering, I think that's distortive. If it's them reaching out, we could do that, but it seems like we could also do that more efficiently just by having proper notifications, et cetera. Yeah, I think it, you're right. It's like a half measure. Um, I think if we got like a reference manager feature working well and we're able to like identify essentially who would be the perfect person to answer this question and push them a notification, that's probably the best way to go about it. Um, but yeah, this, this would be like a social solution until we got to that point.
have we talked about everything that's on the on the list? Yep, that's everything on the agenda. So we've got three minutes to freestyle. So I, I had a quick thought. Um, not sure, just kind of want to toss this out there. I was listening to Andrew Huberman's podcast, and um, it's a lot of information on there. Super useful, which I didn't have to take two hours to go through it, though. Like, the hypothesis feature could be really useful for something like that. With a lot of it can just be laid out and the citate and the you know relevant um, studies also really accessible and commentary is also really accessible. Um, I think that could be really useful. Um, and there are a lot of people, you know, signs popularizers on different uh, platforms that may actually, you know, especially if they could gate it with people paying RSC or something um, to access it. That could be a useful thing for them, um, or or not. I mean, you know, tipping might also work, but just a thought. I think it's a great thought. I, I think like um, a lot of science YouTube videos, like I'm thinking of like Doctor Sinclair and Eleanor Shiki, like they'll uh, address some like uh, you know big picture topic and cite a couple of papers in them. Um, and having like a, a UI where you could this is a little bit of like a tangent here, but um, with our citation manager feature, one thing we've thought about is, you know how when you go on Wikipedia and you see a link to another Wikipedia article, you can just hover over it and it'll like pop up an uh, abstract, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, so that way I don't actually have to click into it, but I can like look up and like, you know, um, see where Nepal is if I want to and what the population of Nepal is, you know, if I'm reading an article. Um, and so I think we could do something very similar with the hypothesis feature. Uh, if we have like a robust citation manager where, um, like people could, you know, add these studies to support a hypothesis, like whatever Huberman's latest episode was about. And then, um, when you're reading kind of like the show notes, you can hover over the paper link and it'll pop up like Wikipedia style abstract. That's like, hey, here's the authors, here's the summary figure, you know, here's the abstract of the paper, and then here's the peer review rating from research hub users or something like that. Um, is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, conceivably, what I was thinking, you know how each section on the YouTube, they're like chapters, essentially, and you can see like what each section relates to. Um, yeah. So if something could be done in like a sim in similar chunks, okay. Uh, where there's like a pop-up, uh, the related citations for the hypothesis related to, you know, every given section. Like the most recent one was just like how to increase dopamine levels, the baseline dopamine levels. And he went through like the history of it and, you know, like what substances increase it in unsustainable ways, et cetera. And they're basically like chapters that like deal with each uh, aspect of that topic. So if he, like each aspect of that topic has a uh, hypothesis and if you could just have like the related um papers you could you could hover over or, you know there can be different ways you could set up the interface um i haven't thought about the optimal way but the fact that there's there are already sort of um chapters or like chunks that you can go through it would be easier to do it that way instead of going through like an entire paper where you read and then check each citation but if it was it was a more like a you know, chapter format, and each one just had like the relevant hypothesis and the relevant uh, papers supporting those hypotheses. And if people could make, you know, comment on them or add uh, new research uh, affecting the conclusions reached there, that would also be super useful. Yeah, this is, it, it's funny you say this, because this is almost exactly what Brian uh, mentioned to our team last week, where what he really wanted is basically the ability to ask the question, like, how do you sustainably increase uh, your dopamine levels and then put a bounty on it and allow for someone like Andrew Huberman to come in and like share, you know, a hypothesis with lots of citations in like a digestible format for anyone who wants to like participate from the outside and like read the answer and like learn from it or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think our, our heads are definitely going in this direction. Um, I think we probably need like, some robust like citation interface 
first in order mm-hmm. to really make it like something like usable. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think I think that would be amazing. And and there are like you know pretty much like like the marketing strategy writes itself, right? Like there's these science influencers that are basically doing this, but this would help make their content like easier to follow along with. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks for bringing it up. I think Joanna had her hand up um, for the last comment here. Yeah, so I just thinking that this is an awesome idea. Nice. Yeah, that's a good one, Edwin. I mean, everything's already segmented already in the YouTube videos. So it's like, I think Loom kind of has something where it's like a in-video um, comment where like you can put like a comment at time number four and you can plug in a comment, but instead of a comment, you for your situation, it would be plugging in different citations for or against um, the comment that was made in the video. Cool. Yep. So that that's it. That's all we have for today. Um, are there any like kind of last minute questions or things that people want to bring up before we call it? Thanks for hosting, Jeff. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. No problem. Okay, everybody. We'll have a good one, and we'll catch you next week. See you, everyone. See you. Bye. See you guys. Bye.